after the Civil War. The death squad, the fascists, and the left said, we want a big, clear box that nobody can stuff. We want to open it before the world with cameras. And we want the ballots taken out and counted in front of all sides. And again, it was quicker uh, results than what we got in Ohio, which uh, this stuff seemed to be delaying a long, long time, to three hours in the morning. All right. Okay, good. All right. Uh, again, the result. BMD security threats, Garland Florida. Career information technology professional. So he's going to tell us why these ballot, uh, these ballot machine marking devices aren't good, not secure. Not secure. All right, thank you, Bob. And uh, it is an honor to be here today with the who's who of the election integrity world. I've uh, seen people I've been talking to for decades, and uh, it's great to see your, your faces. It's just it's really amazing. Um, my name is Garland Favorito. I am the co founder of Voter GA, which stands for Voters Organized for Trusted Election Results in Georgia. Um, we are a true nonpartisan, nonprofit, all volunteer organization. We have the most conservative conservatives, the most progressive progressives, the libertarians, and almost. Uh, I'll talk to you tomorrow about Georgia. Today, I want to talk to you about a new uh, report that we've just come out with. It's called um, Unresolved Security Threats for Ballot Marking Devices. And it's intended as a general guide for uh, the, uh, election, not just election integrity, but for jurisdictions to look at. So I'm gonna race through here just really as fast as I can. Some of you have probably already seen this, this report. It's up on VoterGA.org news tab. So um, I know some of you have, a lot of you are not on our email list yet, so uh, that's where you can take a look at it. So the question is, who am I? Um, some of you don't know me. I'm Ben Angel, the doctor, uh, Miller, who's amazing. I can talk in half an hour about how amazing he's done in his career. But I have a background in uh, these dis disciplines, and that's just a few of them. Um, my only claim to fame is that in February of 2002, I was the first IT professional to question the proposed statewide paperless DRE system on the grounds that it could not be verified and it could not be audited. Uh, I, I wrote, thank you. Thank you. I wrote letters to uh, uh, the assistant secretary at that time, Michael Barnes, who's still there in Georgia, as well as Professor Williams, who, who uh, headed that evaluation. I told them that you know, this system presents a constitutional right to vote problem. Uh, it's in my letter, and you can see that it's in LinkedIn in the paper. Um, they ignored us, as you know, and, and implemented that unconstitutional, and they will be banned in Georgia beginning in 2020. <laughs> so, um, a lot of you want, may want to know how in the world did I know about this in 2002? Um, well, I had, was I knew about government corruption, and I knew about bipartisan government corruption. And I decided to attend a conference in 2000, which probably was the first uh, conference of its kind, a voter fraud conference, conference. It was sponsored by Jim uh, Condon Jr. up in Cincinnati, Ohio, and American Free Press. And they said, look out, rewind back to the summer of 2000. Nobody talked about elections. If you can remember about uh, Jim and Ken Collier, Victoria Collier came to the, this particular conference, and Jim had already passed away at that time. Um, so this was, and, and they said, watch out, there's gonna be this entire attempt to disenfranchise American voters with unverifiable voting. So I said, yeah, I'm a computer guy, I'm gonna go into this, I'll check it out. And I, go, I went into it saying, uh, no, I don't really believe this, and I came out saying, they're absolutely right. Lo and behold, in 2002, uh, we became the test state for this implementation. I'll talk about that tomorrow. Um, but what I want to do is to quickly give you some conclusions on our uh, 
on this paper that I think is going to be helpful to other steps. Um, as you know, um, and I hate to give you the conclusions, but the ballot definition files when they're initially set up and you can attack the voter uh, access authorization um, in order to do the, when they actually make the selections. So there's two points of attack. I'm going to talk mostly about, in the next few days, about the, um, the uh, initial uh, preparation of the machines. But the bottom line is that B&Ds have to be evaluated for security protections. So, whoops. So how do we evaluate them? The study concludes that we need to evaluate ballot quality of every B&D and compare them because there's different types of uh, B&Ds. They're not all the same. Uh, three of the uh, independence is, does this uh, ballot marking device stand alone, or is it an all-in-one hybrid with an integrated tabular? That's a, a major consideration. The second one is completeness of the ballot. Is it a, does it produce a full ballot, or does it produce selection summaries only? Another major consideration. The third thing is clarity. Um, and clarity is it does it have a does it produce a transparent ballot with alignment marks only, or does it produce a ballot with barcodes? And if it produces a ballot with barcodes, are the votes embedded in the barcodes or not? Um, if some some systems have the election ID precinct ID embedded within the barcode, but not the votes. Other ones embed the votes. It's important to know the difference. They're both a security threat. The, um, the one that uh, verifies and puts the votes in barcodes is even worse. So what the study has, I know you all are gonna love this, you have to go out to the study and get it, but it maps all of the current vendor products into these three attributes and gives them uh, a, a green, yellow, or red uh, check marks. So I'll come back to that, but this is on the uh, end of the report, and everybody can get it at voterj.org news tab. Um, I'm going to work, run through these very quickly. Um, um, it, it basically increases the threat of the device adding votes uh, to the ballot after the voter has reviewed it, because you can put that ballot back in the same uh, tab. And uh, it could also spoil votes by adding votes to votes that, that uh, have already been cast by the voter, which would result in an overvote and canceling out the voter's vote. That's two things that a hybrid can do. Um, so for those reasons, it can't secure cast votes. It's not verifiable to the voter because the voter could, could, uh, it could change it after the voter has uh, reviewed it. And uh, therefore, it's really not volatile, and it's flat not suitable for it to conduct any election anywhere in the United States. If the, if the BND embeds votes in a, uh, a barcode, it's not verifiable to the voter. It's no different than what we have now. We have an unverifiable voting system with paperless DREs. If it's not verifiable to the voter, it can't be audited. If it can't be verifiable and audited, it is not suitable for any voter to use anywhere in America or anywhere else in the world. So the other thing that's interesting to mention here is this is also true for ADA voters because remember if an ADA voter has an assistant come uh, and help them, that assistant needs to be able to verify that ballot the same way that um, anybody else would. Privacy. Um, one of the conclusions that this draws is that um, Selection summaries cannot protect ADA voter privacy. You might be familiar about the case in Maryland, where uh, it's a handmark paper ballot state, but they are the voters, uh, ADA voters, are suing because they have to vote on selection summaries. So that is unequal. It could be detected. So uh, bottom line is every a full ballot, not selection summary. Everybody should have a cast of vote on a full ballot. So that is the uh, conclusion. A selection summary cannot support uh, ADA voter privacy and it's not auditable anyway because, as Dr. DeMillo has explained, you have to have a, the memory uh, of, of uh, somebody who's been on Ginkgo for 100 years to be able to, to, 
to verify your ballot. What was the ADA vote? Uh, I'm sorry, Americans with Disabilities Act. I apologize, I'm disabled lawyer. Uh, visually impaired. Okay? Mm -hmm. so, so that leaves us with the last burning question ballot with, uh, as, with trans transparent, so it uses alignment box, not barcodes. Alignment box do not contain data. Barcodes contain data that can corrupt the, the scanner. Uh, by sending instructions. So, so only a standalone BMD that produces full transparent ballots should be acquired for use in elections in the United States of America. Nothing else is acceptable for ADA voter or for any other voter for that matter. So that leaves us with still one burning question, and that is, can a standalone BMD producing a transparent full ballot be used for all voters. And all says, and some of these other uh, jurisdictions are trying to move to a um, um, use BMDs for all voters and even the bad BMDs. So can this be uh, audited and can it be used for all voters? Um, Dr. Stark's probably going to go deeper into this, but what we, we go through all of the conclusions uh, and the problems with auditability, I, I don't want to um, belabor this too long. But, um, so basically, obviously, if you are using a BMD for all voters, you have a much greater risk of rigging that election because there are so many more ways to tamper with it. It's very, it's more difficult, unless of course you're using fashion magic, to, to do it with an ADA voters machines only. Um, but, the other problem, here's the big problem with auditing BMDs, and I think Dr. DeMille has already kind of hit on this, and I know Dr. Stark will as well. But there is no post-election audit procedure that can audit what the BMD displayed to the voter. There's no way to audit that. The voter doesn't have any means to determine if the BMD displayed the races correctly. They don't have any evidence to give to the elections officials. So basically, uh, and they, you know, there's no even there's no source document uh, because there, there's no voter created source document, the machine created. Now, uh, Dr. Wallace um, in, uh, out of Rice has, has suggested um, live parallel audits could solve this problem, and it's a very good suggestion. However, Dr. Starr goes into um, quite a few uh, reasons why they're just simply not practical just a massive number of permutations. The jurisdictions are unwilling uh, to supply the resources for that massive amount of a live parallel audit. You know, you have to audit every machine a couple, three times a day at a minimum. But the bottom line thing here is to reveal, investigate, and resolve the problems. They, their objective, if you really boil it all down, most elections and districts' objectives are to conduct a smooth, uneventful election. And that takes precedence over the ones that have to be accurate. So uh, I don't want to condemn all the elections officials, but we have found that to be true in many, many cases. So, so um, it's politically difficult, even if it would work. So that leaves us with uh, you can. Uh, Audit, uh, uh, if it's transparent, you can audit that as well. But there's no mechanism to audit what the BMD displayed to the voter, and that is what it, the paper ballot is based on. And so if the BMD didn't display the correct information, then the uh, voter is, could have filled out the ballot line and not even known it, even if they could verify it. So, I want to explain this. We, this has happened. We, I believe this actually happened in, in Georgia. So what this paper does, it goes into a new threat model. Um, so far, everybody has talked about a swapped vote threat model. We're all in that mindset. We've been threat model that will, cannot be detected by audit procedures. And here's the way it works. I call it the blocked race threat model for lack of a better term. But 
basically it's selectively conceals races from voters in specific precincts, either based on their demographics or their primary voting history. So it's selective concealment. If you want to rig a race without swapping votes, you just eh, you don't show it. To these people, they're heavily uh, Democratic, heavily Republican. You don't show that race out there. Um, so the way this could work is that at the precinct list, there would be a predefined precinct list that could be included in the malware, or it could be a separate reason filed by the malware. Now, the way that you can trick the voters to not realize that they missed a race is that you would conceal the race initially, but when you get to the summary screen uh, and the voter realizes it, they go back to cast the vote, it then displays the race. The voter would naturally think, oh, I made a mistake, and I just missed it, and they would click it and continue on. Uh, there were several uh, affidavits in our case recently uh, where this, we found that this happened. So I think this is the new threat model that may be coming to your state. I want to give you a heads up and finish up with what Dr. Tamillo had talked about, and that is our lieutenant governor's race. So um, about four or five percent, whereas the other races down ballot or one about one percent um, or more or less so if you look at the lines the lines represent historical if you, if you look at the three lines um let me see if i can point to it with my pointer here yeah there we go so the these two lines are historical drop-off rates for the governor and lieutenant governor's race this was 2018 this dramatic these points represent the down ballot races, Attorney General, Secretary of State, so on and so on. So as you can see, there was this massive drop off in this one lieutenant governor's race that's unexplained, one of the largest unexplained uh, undervotes in uh, electronic voting history. So this is how it detects itself. But in this particular case, it's quite strange because and this, in this case, uh, Sarah Amico, a Democrat, um, was dramatically impacted by this, but yet the Republican Jim Duncan was not. So if we go to the next slide, I don't know if you can see this, the uh, Jeff Duncan's retention rate was about 1.35, which is a pretty normal retention rate um, from governor to lieutenant governor. Sarah Riggs of Nico drops off the chart to 495, and then it goes back up to one for all the other down ballot races, one, one and a half. So, how could this have happened? One way, and we do not know for sure because they have not allowed to do any forensics uh, in Georgia or any substantive forensics yet. Um, so, uh, which is another reason why a lot of it doesn't work. Um, so, um, and I'm, I'm not, I'm not blessed. In the case, um, the studies found that the precincts that had certain demographics, uh, which happened to be Democratic primary voters, or they could have also been, uh, the top correlation was the precincts with uh, most African American voters. So, as you see on the chart there, um, and I cannot read this on my, on my computer, but as the percentage of increase of African American voters came up in these precincts, um, and there were about 100 of the 159 impacted, the uh, undervote rate shot up in a, almost a direct correlation. So uh, this is the way that you could rig an election without actually swapping votes and without actually being detected by auditing principles. We don't know if it happens, but the fingerprints are there for the Lieutenant Governor's race in 2018. So I want to give everybody a, a heads up warning about it could be coming to your state. So one last thing before I open up the question. Voting system cost estimator. And the way this works, if you can use it in any jurisdiction in, uh, that you have. You get the unit prices of the various devices, min and max, 
Just we're giving you a table of assumptions. If you put your assumptions in, whatever count you want to use, it will automatically generate you a cost estimate for handwrite paper ballots, ballot on demand systems, and ballot marking device systems. All automatic. Uh, and there are pros and cons with each uh, one of those systems. There's also a chart to give you what the pros and the cons are for, for um, uh, each of those. And that way you can use that for your jurisdiction and try to help them along and show them what the issues are with these, um, with these machines. So to summary, summarize before I open up the questions, um, what can we do here at, at, at the um, So I'm here uh, all day. I'm spending all day Monday here too, and I think we're going to work on this. So um, we would love to kind of reach some kind of a conclusion. The study is available for uh, anybody to use as a basis and a guide, and, and you may not agree with all the conclusions, so we might have a different uh, something different come out of the task force. But I would really love for us to see to come out. We've got to fight this thing quickly and fast because um, quickly and fastly. How about just quickly? Uh, because as you know, as you know, uh, with new money, new money is coming down from the federal government and the restrictions are not there. We're going to have have all taxpayer expense. And we want the verge of that happening again. So I think the task force can do everything it can to stop this and hopefully the path position. So with that, thank you very much. Is it inherent that a, um, 
foul marking device produces barcode? Because no. it seems no. inherently uh, against the interests of the voters. Uh, uh, well, right, and uh, I'm glad you mentioned that because these voting machine vendors have been doing things that are inherently against the interests of the voters for 17 years, ever since I. The reason I got into it was I knew they had to be doing this on purpose. Yeah. It, it can't be an accident. You can't make 20 different security flaws in one system by accident. Benny's in the business. He knows that. He and I would be on the streets after two. You know, when you get one step, one, one, uh, one, uh, Strike and you're out, or two, anyway. Um, so, I'm oh, sorry, I got off track. What was your name? Just, where do these, why barcodes oh. when, when that's not what the vote is? Why do you have barcode votes? Yeah. Nobody can answer it. They, they, they try to say, well, oh, it's faster. I said, well, wait a minute. It's a one millisecond faster. Can you measure that when you're when you're top of the screen? So, obviously, that's a lie. But they, that's one of the lies that they use. Uh, there is no excuse for having a barcoded uh, ballot that I can see, and particularly a barcoded voting ballot. There's no excuse on, uh, on earth for that. The other one, someone used it for a lacking marks. Uh, one of the many jobs. I'm from the same county, and I talk to our. Uh, can you use the mic, She said that she's only using 19 in this election. She plans to use 120 in the next one. She says it's only for the disabled voters and, uh, and it's federally mandated. Um, and she thinks that that's the only thing a disabled voter could do. Okay, so here's, this would be my argument for that. Um, that's good that you want to take care of the disabled voters. But well, let's go back to this slide that we talked about for disabled voters. I don't know if I can find it right now. So if a disabled voter brings their assistant in to verify the ballot, let's suppose if I'm a disabled voter, I necessarily would not have somebody who assists me to verify the ballot. That voter, that assistant, cannot verify a barcoded voting ballot. If, if, if that's not possible. So my suggestion would be to go back to her and explain that, that the ADA, she's not doing the ADA a, a, a service unless that ballot is a clear ballot, transparent ballot, and it doesn't have barcoded votes. It just uses alignment marks with no data. I would argue that, and then I would argue since she's already bought them, to go back to the vendor and get and do the same thing that the state of Colorado has already done. The state of Colorado is really leading elections in this country right now. We would change over this hardware, reprogram it with two software, we want the full ballot, we want no barcodes on it, and Dominion's going to force to do it. So it sounds great. She wanted to give the voters, the disabled voters, privacy. Well, she Price can't do that right. with a selection summary. I know. She can't do it. And so I would point her to Maryland. The disabled voters in Maryland are suing right now. Oh. So that will solve the problem. How can we help? Challenge process and a possible recount. And he said, when you have ballot summary cards, 
There is nothing to debate. There's no voter intent issue to resolve before an election board acting as a jury. And they don't want to act as a jury. They don't want that role. And that, I'm just saying, you know, that that's what I was told. And I think that actually is a very underappreciated aspect of the impact of these. Um, because there are hundreds of thousands of these machines that are coming online. And, and um, the other thing I would add, ask you, though, for Georgia is you've got people who are working with your state election officials right now telling them that they can be elected. And they're writing studies that are going to be published in the next couple of weeks saying that these machines are friendlier to people, lower income people, lower education people. This is, you know, even this is for, you know, people of color in the South, for people with disabilities. And this is coming out from, you know, a lot of Washington policy types and some other national groups. So what, what do you do about that? Because you got like, you're saying stop, 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 and they're sitting at the desk with the folks around these elections that you're just talking about, where, you know, and, and they're saying, you know, we, we can do this, and we're going to lend our organizational, you know, stamp of approval to this, and this is happening in your state. So yeah. what, what do you do about that? Well, first of all, that's why I've been defending, um, to counteract part of that. Um, the, the problem is, you can get somebody, an academic, to uh, to write a study that was going to support their viewpoint. They did this with another guy named, I think his name was Dan Becker. They published it in the AJC, and Becker got taken to the cleaners after that was published. But unfortunately, damage is done because the uninformed reader sees that. So all we can do is keep doing our own studies like Dr. Stone, Dr. DeMello, and keep uh, putting those out and refuting the other studies because they are buying, you know, they're, they're paying somebody to, to give them an opinion that they want. And, and there isn't a whole lot we can do. We're using our tax money to do that. Um, but thank you. And uh, well, I, I'm, I'm out of time. So. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.